fine, and then go from there. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the timingresearch.com Analyze Your Trade, uh, episode number 157 for April 27th, 2021. Ooh. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of timingresearch.com. And today, um, the option professor and I have arranged a special episode for you. He is sharing his screen now, and he's going to go over some of the uh, the uh, top movers for uh, for this week and uh, give you his uh, market analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the option professor. Okay, thanks a lot, David, and good to be with you, everybody. Quick background on myself. I'm a graduate of Boston College, and I've got decades of experience here in the investment arena, and I've been educating and instructing people on the uses and risks of investing for many, many years, thousands and thousands of people. So I'm going to try to put my opinions and my observations in front of you here, and you'll get an idea of uh, what we're looking at. And uh, I'm going to go through the horn on things such as income, growth, speculation, international, because we do have a weekly uh, update that we hand out to subscribers, and we give you an update on these four basic areas uh, where people can try to make some money. And um, we have been doing, in our opinion, an excellent job, and people that have been uh, reading our materials have been very happy with the content. So without further ado, I am going to um, start out with some income ideas. And basically, uh, one of the income ideas that we work with uh, for people who want to get a more aggressive income is a preferred stock. Uh, it pays much better than anything else. Um, and it is uh, on the uh, doesn't have any voting rights, but it is in the upper echelon as far as liquidation of a company. In other words, it's ahead of the common stock. Now, uh, people do uh, get these uh, type of investments because they want the income and it trades more like a bond than it trades like a stock. But again, there's a little bit of both in them. A lot of banks issue preferred stock. Now, again, here you go with PFF. And I think the yield on this thing is well over 4%. So that's not too shabby. And as you can see, uh, during the drop, like everything else, it has a big drop down. But then since then, well, let's give you just the last year, give you a, a shorter term perspective. Yeah, as you can see, uh, ever since we had the big uh, drop, this thing has been appreciating up while you're getting better than four or 5% on your money. So is that a bad deal? It looks like a pretty good deal to me. So there you go. You got a rising market and you follow the moving averages as we like to do here. And obviously um, it's a little bit extended. So maybe it'll pull back a little bit, but while it's dancing around back and forth here, you are looking at getting better than 4% cash flow uh, distribution on your money. So that's number one, uh, as far as uh, some of the things we're looking at for income, and that pays monthly. Uh, another thing we look at is uh, uh, high yield. And when we do that, we turn towards the Vanguard um, uh, mutual fund because their fees are so low, okay, management fees compared to others, they have an ability to go out and try to look for value uh, that you might not be able to get as much of if you had higher fees because the higher fees have to come out of your, your expenses come out obviously of your fund. Anyway, this is another one in the last year that has been very friendly to us. As you can see, there's the market going up and you're getting probably four or 5% cash flow on that throughout the whole period. So not too shabby. Uh, another way to get some income on your money and also uh, to... Uh, obviously be diversified. And of course, uh, the high yield means you are taking higher risk, but the spreads between high yield and corporates have shrunk down very dramatically. So if you're a believer that the stock market and the markets in general and the economy are going to be pretty good, uh, then this thing may very well remain pretty steady as it has been. Lately, it's been going kind of flat, but don't forget, it pays a very good distribution while you're just watching it go back and forth. Uh, another uh, area we look for to get some uh, income on is using uh, loans, um, uh, secured loans. And uh, for that, we go to Fidelity floating rate high income. And of course, in this situation, uh, this is also paying very well uh, with relatively short maturities. And basically you're looking at uh, another market that in the last year has been a very good friend to us and also has been paying a very strong distribution. So getting good cash flow on your money while your principal goes up like that is not a bad deal. Now, you can get prospectuses on this from this respective companies, um, the iShare, uh, Fidelity and uh, Vanguard. So you can get more information on it. But if you're looking to juice up your uh, 
you know, cash flow and you're making zero in the bank and you're willing to take some additional risk with part of your capital to try to get some net cash flow on your money. These are three things that we've been looking at. And as you can see from the chart, it has not been a bad deal. Again, each week we go up and we over and we give you updates on things, um, uh, on ways to get income. And a lot of you guys out there retired, want to make some money on income. That's another way to go. Here's the two base uh, cases that we have as far as income. This is a short-term corporate bond fund and it's investment grade. And you'll see this is a, you know, been paying nicely and it has been kind of going uh, pretty well. We had the drop, uh, we had a big jolt in the interest rate market, but it only lost eight, uh, eight or six or eight cents um, on the NAV and it's already recovering. And again, during this period, you're still making money on your cash flow coming in as far as the distribution. So that's uh, one of the uh, core places. And then we do like the tax free, you know, we are going to be seeing high taxes from. Uh, uh, the uh, administration to help pay for these things. So these uh, diversified um, uh, tax exempt, this one's out of Vanguard, uh, has also been a pretty good deal as well in our opinion. As you can see from uh, a year ago, it's gone up very nicely. And then it had the dip in the first quarter when people were panicking out of the bonds. And then basically you're looking at this. You know, our view on fixed income is uh, there could be an inflationary shock coming down the road. Okay, we all know that because we've got a supply chains all bottled up and we've got a lot of people out there wanting to buy stuff. So that creates a little bit of a tight supply demand dynamic. And then of course they can charge higher prices. But the reality is supply chains will be rectified. And in the longer term, you've got money supply going through the roof, which everybody hangs their hat on. Oh, the gold is going to go to $9,000 an ounce. Look at that money supply. Hey, listen, there's another part of the category there. It's called money velocity. And money velocity is, is when people actually are spending the money. And then wherever they spend the money, those people go out and spend money. And then where they spend money, those people make money and keep spending it. And that's called velocity. Where a lot of the money has gone is to pay down debt and deleverage household balance sheets. It's also going to savings. So when you hear that savings are at records, right? And you hear that the people are uh, deleveraging and they're not taking loans out. Remember when the banks came out, they said their loan demand stinks. That's not money velocity. That's actually lousy and is very difficult, if not impossible, to have inflation if you don't have velocity and money supply growing. Uh, because it is a two-edged sword. So again, our feeling right now is, as the Fed says, you may get a couple of spikes on it, but you know, inflation has been between zero and 5% pretty much since 1960. So betting against that you know, is what they call looking for a long shot. Uh, again, with the environment of the reopening, the pent-up demand, some supply chains being goofed up, Sure, you can get some big reads, but you might not want to load the boat that that's going to be consistently happening because after they, again, have the pent up demand spent and after they fix the supply chains, which they ultimately do, then obviously sustaining high inflation numbers and high GDP numbers could be a rough racket, which is exactly what the Fed's saying. Okay, so there you go. You got some ideas on how to try to make some money with the uh, uh, with uh, the income side, and those I think are uh, uh, five or six ways that I think make an awful lot of sense. Uh, this is our opinion, and this is our observation. Obviously, you guys all make your own decisions. Uh, with regards to growth, again, uh, we had a very big hit on uh, tech in the first quarter because when rates spike up high valuations get whacked. And then when rates stabilize, people got back on the tech train. So obviously there are certain uh, um, uh, ways of playing that. A lot of people like to use the cues. So how do the cues look as far as the moving averages are concerned? Let's take a look. Uh, obviously you can see they got back on the bicycle at 320. That was your buy signal. You should be long at 320 and then obviously hanging with it right now. And realistically, you don't want that spot taken out. So that's about 335. You start taking out 335 and 330, you're going to go down and test these moving averages. And if you break them again, the big support is 325. So again, this looks like you should be on the long side, as long as we stay above 335 and 325. And again, you know, the cues are all the type of uh, tech stocks and, uh, and uh, mega cap uh, stocks. So a uh, mega cap tech. So you'll have your apples and Amazons and everything else in there.
Uh, another way to play it uh, is going with uh, some of these ETFs that we like. Uh, this one is the uh, uh, ETF uh, Vanguard Growth. You know, these guys, uh, they run their mutual funds and their ETFs under an idea that they're trying to keep the cost down as close to zero as possible. That's not a bad deal. So the bottom line is, is that's why we gravitate and, uh, and we look towards the Vanguard funds and ETFs because their expense ratios are extremely low. Uh, with regards to this one here, again, it got whacked in the first quarter. So you had uh, the market get underneath the averages. You got your buy signal here at 260. And look, you're already up 17 bucks here. Okay. Again, you don't want it under 270 at this point in time, and certainly not underneath the 262 area right here. But it looks pretty good right now. And uh, so far, so good. Um, let's take a look here at uh, another one, which is uh, the semiconductors. Another way to get some growth. And the semis, uh, again, they're back on their bicycle a little bit here. Here you got NVIDIA and advanced micro devices and uh, Taiwan Semi and all the great guys, right? Again, whacked in the first quarter because of high spiking of interest rates had a rally, came back down and tested the average. You see, I like these averages because when they hold, they look pretty good. Another buy signal right there at 240. And now we're up here at 251. You take out 260 and you're into the ozone and who knows where it'll stop. So the bottom line is, is you're in a good situation here. You'd like to stay at above 250. And then of course, there's your second line in there at about 247. And then your last line comes in at around 242. They're all inverted to the upside. Nothing wrong with that. Prices are above all three. Nothing wrong with that. But again, you know, there are some people looking for a correction. This guy uh, from Morgan Stanley is looking for a correction. And um, the guy from BlackRock Reader was talking about frothy and we could correct. So, you know, not everybody's on the long train. Some people think that the COVID cases are going to start rolling over dramatically as we get to 40 and 60 percent vaccination. And if that's true and it acts like Israel, where we tank on the cases and the deaths and everything, then it could put a risk on going on in the next month. And if it does risk on, 4,400 is not off the table. And then of course, if this does not pan out this way, then of course, and you see it take out 240 here, then obviously the something's changed. And if something changed, obviously you have to make adjustments. But uh, right now, you know, uh, if we start uh, continuing higher for the rest of this week and we take out 260, you know, it could be game on as far as the upside is concerned. Um, again, there are those who believe on either side. It's going to, it looks like it's going to be a binary event off to the 4,200 level on the S and P either the 4,200 is going to hold and selling calls up here and buying puts against your stock and trimming and replacing stock with calls or call spreads is the exact thing to do. If this is going to blow through 4,200 because the cases start dropping and all the people that watch the VIX is underneath 20, they're comfortable with taking a shot at this thing. They're going to hear these earnings coming out and they're not going to realize that the comparisons on Q1 and Q2 this year are going to be a joke because in Q1 and Q2 last year, we were closed. Well, obviously, if your business is closed, your revenue is going to be a heck of a lot higher now. And of course, if you cut expenses, which we talked about a year ago in the newsletter, that there's going to be operating le leverage that you've never seen. And there you're going to have revenues picking up returning back towards normal, and you got the expenditures uh, down. So obviously that's going to be blowout earnings on the upside. So could we take out this 4,200 and go to 4,400? There's a very good risk of that. If in fact, we get this COVID uh, news in the next week or two, that is very, very attractive. Um, conversely, we've banked against 4,200 enough that if it starts rolling over and taking out some of the support, then obviously, the binary event would be to the downside at that point. But again, it is a longer term bull market, but even in bull markets, you get pullbacks. And, uh, you know, we haven't had much of one in the S&P in, in a couple of hundred S&P points. So we'll have to see what goes on. Uh, again, so I showed you that, the semis in that, and uh, let's see where else we're looking for in the uh, growth area. Okay, let's look at some of the sectors, you know, uh, again, we're getting away and have gotten away a little bit from, uh, from uh, relying on tech. 
you know, so we went into the material area as far as uh, what our focus is. You can see that has not been a bad place to be in the last year, and it continues to perform as we speak. So there's your moving averages, there's the price, everything looks pretty darn good. If we've got, got under the first moving average, 179, that's your warning signal, 176 and 174 had better hold up as well. So you got your nice moving averages to follow. You got an uptrend. And obviously with the boom going on in the economy and construction and infrastructure coming, materials are obviously, and some of the bottlenecks, the materials have been a great place to be. Another place has been the industrials, you know, your defense contractors and all your uh, Boeings and uh, Honeywells and all those kind of guys. Uh, here, uh, we're looking at another uh, market that's been absolutely fabulous to be involved. Here, you're diversified in this sector, so you're not holding on to just one company. And then there you go, there you go, there you go. So looking great. And again, unless it starts breaking down, the path of least resistance remains up. You know, the transports have been doing great. And the reason for that is why? Because there's a lot of people, a lot of things being bought online. You saw UPS blow it out today. And how many, you know, ways can you transport things? There's only a finite amount of ways, right? You got railroads, but there's not unlimited railroads. You've got trucking. Basically, it's FedEx and UPS and everybody else is playing catch up. And then basically you've got, uh, you know, JB Hunt and stuff like that. So the bottom line is, is that this has been a great place to be. And as you can see, the economy comes back, the transports go up. You got more people delivering packages, the transports go up. It's been a great place to be. IYT is the way you play that. Small caps. This is the one where if we're gonna go to 4,400 on the S&P, this thing could get involved in a very big way. And this one is called the uh, Russell. Well, I'll just give you the, uh, the ETF. The Russell, this is small caps, okay? And if you look at small caps here, you can see that it has been a very good ride. Now, again, it got nailed here, but is it above the moving averages now? And it's not that far above it. So this thing starts taking out 234, and now you're into uncharted territory again. And right now, as long as it stays above these three lines, which is anywhere between 221 and 224 ballpark figures, uh, you know, you could get taken off pretty good. Uh, support should be on any kind of pullback around these highs at 225. But right now, if there is going to be a stampede into the markets, this has a lot of the epicenter stocks, which means the reopening stocks. And these are the companies that could benefit very well if this pent up demand and this COVID news all come together because this has been very sensitive to the COVID news. And when COVID improves, boom, there you go. In fact, this dip happened about the time India was having all their trouble as well. But again, it's back on the bicycle. It's not very far from the moving averages. We suggest very strongly keep an eye on that one. Um, what else do we got going for you here on the growth side? Let's take a look. Well, of course, um, you've got um, real estate. This is uh, REITs, and also it has some of the um, uh, cell towers in it, like American Tower, and Crown Castle, those kind of guys. Not a bad place to be, right? And it's been really appreciating lately. So this thing pays a good dividend. It's been going up nicely. It's above all its moving averages. Again, real estate has not been a bad place to be lately. And in the last uh, month or two, it's really starting to accelerate. Because people, I think, are finding out that the world didn't come to an end. Malls are not going totally out of business. Data centers are going to be needed. And other, and other real estate uh, things are going to go on. And like some of the banks said, you can't mentor people over the phone as well as you can in person. So there are some businesses that are going to want to get together in their offices because they just don't want to work in their pajamas the rest of their life. So again, this is making a comeback after being very much under pressure for a long time and going nowhere. It has definitely gotten back on the bicycle. Um, another two, of course, that we all know of is the financials, something we talked about in the newsletter a year ago. I mean, come on, Wells Fargo at 20 bucks, 25 bucks. What are they going to go out of business? It's a gimme. Now, now it's double that, you know? So here you go. Uh, you've had a nice trend on this thing all the way up. 
all the way up. And these things pay dividends too. So there you go. You got a pretty nice rising trend there. And right now there's nothing showing that it's changed at all. Um, the other one is uh, energy. What are we going to go to electric cars tomorrow? I don't think so. So are they going to need energy? Yeah. Is there a lot of energy out there? Let's think about it. Did they close a lot of rigs? Yeah. Did they uh, shut down fracking? Yeah. Is private equity who got totally destroyed uh, running in there to try to put money into uh, fossil fuels? Probably not. So what does that make the dynamic? That makes the dynamic potentially a situation where uh, the demand is going to outstrip the supply. Now, you've had a big drop from 76 on this particular ETF all the way down to 64. That's a pretty good drop. And now we're back up. If we can stay above these moving averages again, which is 66 and a half and 67.40, if we can get above there and then get back above the top one here, which is at 68.82, then this thing could get back on the bicycle very well. Because look at if you look at the 20 year graph, this thing's got a lot of real estate to go, a lot of real estate to go. Okay. So again, it's backing and filling and this and that, but this is a sector energy that we think is very underrepresented in most people's portfolios. And it could be a situation where it could be a very dynamic place to be. If you want a more aggressive play, this is the oil services sector from Van Eck. And if you look at the long-term graph here, you are looking at a tremendous amount of upside if this thing started to turn. So again, these are the two areas that we're looking at on the energy front that look very good to us. On the gas front, we look at LNG. And again, we follow this stuff in the newsletter and that's why people get the newsletter to keep informed on this kind of stuff. And if they have questions, they can shoot us a question at our email address, optionprofessor at gmail.com. So there you go. This is uh, one that we've liked a long time. This is in our view, the Cadillac of the, energy, of the natural gas sector and this thing got uh, hit here when it went down here during the crash. But ever since it got above 55 and 60, it's been clear sailing on the upside. And we think this is a really good one for people who want to get exposure to the natural gas uh, industry. Um, okay, some other ones that uh, had corrections that we think look pretty good. Leisure and travel and entertainment. And this one, I think, uh, well, we think looks very, very good. So there you go. It uh, had a big drop during the crash, ran up to 55, came back down here to 45. Let's bring it in on the one year. And you can see on the one year, it's gotten above its short-term averages, gets above 48, it's back in the game. And this thing looks like it has made a turn. That looks like a pretty good low at 44 to trade against right there. Okay, and that's a leisure and entertainment. So, you know, it's going to have restaurants in there and all kinds of stuff you do for leisure and entertainment, which we all know got totally whacked during the drop. So this is a way of playing that. Uh, we think these casinos uh, might also be worth something because people are going to want to do some gaming uh, and uh, they've got the um, household net worth to do it. And so here's one right here, uh, BJK on its way up nicely today. And uh, that's something to keep an eye on. This will get you into all the gaming activities. And you know, there's a lot of gaming out there, whether it be DraftKings, Churchill Downs, Penn Gaming, uh, you know, Caesars, MGM Grand, uh, Las Vegas Sands, you know, you know, they're all over the place. Okay, and it looks like it's just beginning to take off. <clears throat> Let's see what else we got for you here. Let's see how some of the ARC funds are doing. You know, they kind of were acting like a dog lately, but let's see how they do now. They could be coming back into favor. Let's see. Yeah, they're still having some trouble. Yeah, if you get above, it looks like it's making a turn though. You see, you got moving averages underneath the price. That's thing bad. You get above 130, this thing's back on the bicycle. It looks like it's made its turn right now. So you got a low point here to defend. And again, if you can take out 130, that would be you know, kind of a confirmation that it looks like uh, that money's coming back in. Um, another one is their medical one. And uh, genomic revolution. And this again is just turning as well. So they're looking like they could be getting back on the bicycle and everybody's talking about FinTech. And so they got one for that too.
And there you go. So they all look pretty similar in that they look like they've made their turn, but they need to take out some resistance to get the green light. And this one is a couple of bucks away from getting the full green light if it can take out 56. Then all these averages are moving up and the price is taking out highs and you should be in pretty good shape. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Um, well, let's look at some value. OK, because value is also what people are into. And if you're going to go mega cap value, this is as good as any as far as we're concerned. OK, and as you can see here, been a very good trend value all the way up, all the way up, all the way up, accelerating in the last few months, right? From 80 up to 97, what is that, 20% jump? Plus it pays 2% or better dividend, nothing wrong with that. And again, uh, this uh, could keep going and going and going if in fact uh, people still believe that value with its reasonable div dividends, reasonable valuations is where money wants to go in a later cycle of the recovery because we're not in the initial cycle anymore. We're in the intermediate cycle and at least that. And then basically these are the kind of things that can go up. Um, okay, so that gives you some of the ideas of what's going on. Uh, we are keeping an eye on uh, international, which I'll get into in a second, but uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of idea on, uh, on what we're looking at here. Uh, another one, uh, well, we'll get into, let's get into some of the more speculative areas now. And uh, let's start out with, um, with Riot. And uh, this is a company obviously involved with the crypto. And it had a big run up, it had a big pullback. And let's see what it looks like now. Yeah, so it's in bad shape now as far as the one year is concerned because the whole all the averages are above and it's having some hard time. So this one, again, you know, if you just were an aggressive trader and thought that that low was a spike low that's going to hold, you could trade against that point there. And again, it has fallen from 80 to 40. So it is a 50% drop or better. And when you get down to 61, this might even be about a 61% drop um, down. And so, you know, that's probably why it hit 35 and held. So if you want to use that spot as a re-entry, realize you're fighting the tape as far as the moving averages are concerned. But if you took something down here, you could think about adding as it got above the first one at 44, got above the second one at 47, got above the third one at 50. And then if this thing's going back in the game, you will have been able to stage into the market. Um, Another one that we've been watching in the speculative arena is uh, Ethereum. And the reason for that is because it's obviously less uh, pricey than its buddy Bitcoin. And so that's why we thought it was a better value. And as you can see, you know, getting it at uh, 20 on, the, this is the grayscale, getting it at uh, 18 here and 20 and then adding and adding, you know, you're doing pretty good. And it looks, it looks like it obviously um, is doing pretty good. It's, it's extended a little bit, but again, people may be rotating some of their profits out of Bitcoin and taking a shot here. Uh, DeFi is a big thing with these people. And so uh, it's something to keep an eye on in the crypto area. Uh, let's take a look at coin. It got whacked on the opening uh, when it came out. And let's see if it has any kind of... Uh, some people were thinking uh, somewhere between two and 250 and 200 might be a better place. It's, yeah, it's back up to three. Uh, what's the low been? Let's see, the one month. Yeah, it looks like the low, it did break under 200. Let's go with the five day and see if that gives us anything. Yeah, so it broke under uh, 300. Obviously that wasn't a bad value down here at 280. And uh, now it looks like it is trying to turn back up. Longer term, this is supposed to be a great one uh, because of all the ways they can make money. Um, and, uh, you know, the more normalization crypto gets with regards to uh, companies like JP Morgan coming out with an ETF or um, companies accepting it, et cetera, et cetera, it's more helpful, more helpful. Our feeling has been, and it still remains, that when uh, Bitcoin drops 30 to 50%, 
off of its current, you know, off of whatever move it makes, that's the time you take a shot at it because it does give you 30 to 50% drops fairly often. And seems like when you buy it on a big drop, you do a lot better than buying it on strength. So basically that's our feeling as far as uh, the crypto is concerned. Wait for drops, they'll be coming. When they come, that's when you take your shot. But again, it's uh, not for the faint of heart. It's very, very volatile. And that's why, you know, you, people put a percentage of it in, but they don't go nuts. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, inflation. Inflation is supposed to give us a surprise shock sometime this year. Why? Because pent up demand is going to go nuts and we have uh, supply chain problems. So you've seen it in a lot of commodities. And we'll show you right now <clears throat> how we've been uh, telling our subscribers <clears throat> how you can take advantage of it. Okay, let's start out with uh, the gold. And with gold, we tend to look to GDX. And as you can see, GDX uh, bottomed out around 30, which is where we thought it would. And now it's gone up about 20% off of that number, 15% off of that number. And uh, we think that that 30, let's get the chart up here a little longer term. Yeah, so you can see, we think the, the market bottomed out here at 31, which if you looked at a longer term graph, like a five year, you can see that's where the support was. You see these are, this right here is a high point. That's a high point. And so when you come in, those are low points. So do you notice it stopped right where we thought it would against those lows and against those highs. And now we're back on the bicycle a little bit. Could have more room to work, but we do think later in the year, this thing should benefit from an inflationary shock. Okay. Now let's look at another place where we go, which is uh, the silver. And we look there at the SILJ. And in there, this is another one that is uh, down in the $15 area. And again, uh, we think as long as it, uh, it came down here and made a low around 14, now it's about above the lines. I think once it takes out 1650, you'd be in a very good condition for it to go further. So again, we'd like to see a little bit more strength because again, these lines are all coming in at around 1528, 1528 and 1570. So if it holds this and then takes out 1650, you should be off to the races there as well. Um, looking towards um, um, ones that have uh, some platinum exposure as well as gold and silver. One that we look at is SB SBSW and SBSW. has been uh, a good place to be as well. As you can see, it's been matriculating up very nicely. And this has all types of metals in it. And uh, you know, you'd like it to stay above the moving averages, which comes in 1876. They try to dip it a little bit, but you know, again, the, as long as we can stay above these averages, it's not a bad looking one. And then uh, of course, uh, this one here, we showed people when it was 10 bucks uh, a share a year ago. And uh, this has not been a bad place to be either. This is Freeport McMoran. So as you can see, it's trended nice. And again, we talked it a year ago, all right? What's a year ago? Uh, actually even more than that. Uh, but here you go, you're, uh, you're in here um, in August of 2020. So that's even what, six months ago, seven months ago. And look at that run from 12 all the way up, okay? Now, again, I try to use the moving average to make sure the trend is still intact. And the key is, are the moving averages rising? As long as the blue line continues to rise, uh, we should be in good shape. Because even when it gets penetrated, if it's still rising, it can get going. Obviously, this is a very advanced stage for this. It only doesn't look advanced if you pull the curtain back and you see where it used to be years ago. So obviously, if it's going to keep going, you know, but it also at this 40 number does have some resistance. So again, with this kind of an overbought situation, uh, a sane man would have to say, try to buy it on a dip. Another one that we uh, showed people that was a big winner here is um, the one out of Peru. That this thing paid a dividend of like two or 3%, which is not a bad thing to get on your money while you're watching this kind of appreciation. I mean, you're getting appreciation and, uh, and income, nothing wrong with that, right? And this thing went nuts as soon as it got above 40, went all the way to 80. Again, like the other one, it's extended. So you got to be careful up here. But again, uh, this one has not been a bad one either. And uh, this one is actually making all time highs, whereas Freeport has not. But again, they're extended. And, you know, to come in with a new position at this extended level, you know, is dangerous. 
Um, and then uh, some of the industrial metal, Cleveland Cliffs. Look at this one. Cleveland Cliffs. There you go. Um, look at that on a long term graph. There's a lot of potential to this thing if it gets going. Okay. This is more on the industrial metal side. And again, if you look at the one year, uh, again, as long as we can stay above 16 and 17, you know, we still like the looks of this thing gets above 21, then you're going to start accelerating again. So keep an eye on this because this is uh, something that would uh, benefit from uh, different things. And uh, those of you who are looking to try to get a spot in, uh, in infrastructure, PAVE is the way to go in our view. Uh, gives you a one-stop shop and uh, it's been hanging in there pretty good. So if you think there's a big future, all this infrastructure talk, this thing's already been a very good winner for the last year, right? Boom, 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 boom. And it's above the moving average. So you know where your guideline is there. Uh, you wouldn't want it underneath 25 bucks and it's at 26 bucks, not a big difference. And uh, so you don't have too much rope to give it. And if there's a future, maybe this thing could participate. So that's your one-stop shop if you wanna hit the infrastructure uh, companies. Um, another one uh, that uh, can be good and it's a little speculative because the, the companies are all debt ridden now and uh, we don't know if they're going to be able to actually meet the supply if it comes out. So this is jets. This is all your airlines. See, they broke it down pretty good here. If it gets back above 27, we'd like that as well because we are going to be coming into a better demand season. And again, uh, this is a one-stop shop for your airlines. But you definitely want to get some strength out of this thing because it has crossed over all these lines and that's not the greatest setup. So again, if you can get above 27, might be something to take a look at. Um, lithium. You know, these batteries need lithium. So LIT is a one-stop shop for your lithium and batteries. And what do you got here on lithium? Uh, you got something that got hit in the first quarter, like everything else did. Now it's back on the bicycle. So as long as we stay above 60, looks okay. <clears throat> you got all the averages merging right around 60. So at least you know where your line in the sand is. And again, if this is really going to have the future that it looked like it had back here, it could be getting back on the bicycle. So keep an eye on this one because, you know, batteries and lithium and all that stuff, you know, seems to be where people are focused on for people that are looking at long-term growth. Um, we were also looking at cybersecurity. So we we're looking at FireEye. And um, FireEye had that breach, you know, and then the uh, thing came down. But now it looks like it's trying to get back on the bicycle, as you can see there. So your risk between where it is and the moving averages isn't much. And if it can start taking out 21, 22, this thing could start accelerating because it already showed you it could go. Then it had a pullback. Again, they had bad news. The bad news is now behind them. And now it looks like the reality of cybersecurity being needed in all types of forms might be coming back into the, into the, into the fort. Um, I had an associate tell me a little bit about uh, storage. You know, uh, people having to move, they need to store things. So uh, one of the, a couple of the big stocks in there have been great. And uh, again, maybe people need storage because they bought so much stuff uh, during the lockdown, they can't store it all. This thing is, is an advanced. So it has been great in the last, what, a few months here, a couple of months, look at it, boom. Actually, I think it's about one month. So obviously there's a real uh, boom in the public storage uh, business. A couple of other ones you can keep an eye on is uh, EXR, which you can see there is pretty much a horse of a similar color. And uh, let's see what you got there. Yeah, same thing, looking great. Could have a pullback, but the trend looks like it's pretty darn good. You're not early to the party, but the party may last longer than you think because of uh, the real estate uh, activity. Uh, and there's only a limited amount of uh, storage space. And uh, so again, that limited supply and great demand, you see what the price does, right? Um, and again, uh, I don't know if I, oh, I showed you the transportation, you got to see that. And then uh, we did show you the metals and that. Okay, what I'm gonna do now, I think, well, uh, some people were thinking uh, some of these uh, drug companies were gonna be pretty good. Let's take a look at Amgen. <clears throat> 
Amgen needs to cl uh, clear, I think, 266. And if it does that, or maybe 260. And then if it does, yeah, if it clears 260, I think you're in the you're in the ballpark. It obviously looks like it's turned. It obviously looks like it's in an uptrend. And this is a great company. But in the post market here, it's down 12. So you can see it's filling in all the way down to this gap here. They probably announced earnings and obviously the earnings didn't come out so good. So again, this is a classic case of if you waited for the breakout of 260, you would have paid more, but you would have paid more on its way to 270. Whereas if you try to buy it before it breaks out to 260, you can end up buying it at 255 and ending up holding the bag at 243 if the news does not hold. So obviously one of the reasons why I was having trouble making highs is the news was coming out and the news obviously was not great. Okay, um, let's just see what else do we have here. Well, this was one that I wanted to see how it was doing. iPay, this is one with mobile payments. And you know, this is a big thing, mobile payments. And you can see from the chart, it has had a very, very good run. So let's take a look and see what it looks like now. Yeah, it had a drop down into the 66 area and now it's back on the bicycle. Again, um, this thing here uh, is part of the big movement uh, for mobile payments. And obviously this is uh, not a bad one to be in. It's a one-stop shop for all the different mobile payment uh, stocks. So keep an eye on that one as well. All right, let's turn towards international and then I'm gonna get into the commodities. Um, <clears throat> international, okay. Here's what we were thinking. Six months ago, the US was in a big mess and they didn't have the vaccine yet and everyone was locked down, right? So we were thinking since the six month discounting of the market, we thought that the value was a tremendous value, it was a tremendous bargain then because we thought growth had already obviously discounted and gone up tremendously. Plus the interest rate environment was changing. We were getting a steepening of the yield curve, which means what? Which means the growth stocks that have these earnings that they're discounting out into eternity have to be revaluated and that's gonna tighten or compress the valuation. And then bam, you're gonna get whacked in tech. But value likes to have uh, the steepening yield curve, things like banks where they loan long and they and uh, they bar uh, they uh, they uh, pay interest on short term deposits, which are at zero, and then they loan longer term, which went way up sharply in the Q1. And again, that was the whole thing we talked about back in September to the people in the newsletter. OK, so the bottom line is, is that was the place to be. Banks went nuts. Energy went nuts. Uh, value companies went nuts. Um, uh, you saw industrials and materials went nuts. And these are the guys that benefit from a steepening yield curve. OK, now, international, you know Europe is having trouble getting their vaccine squared away, but they're going to get it squared away in our view. And it's going to happen by Labor Day, like we're going to be up and running by July 4th. After us is going to become Europe, and after that is going to come emerging market by the end of the year. So whatever's going on in India now, we anticipate these emerging markets will get things resolved by the end of the year. So what do you do if you think that's the case? What you do is you start looking at things in Europe. And so what can you see in Europe? Because that's the next game in town, and you want to skate where the puck is going. So the financials, what do you think banks in Europe are going to do if they do a lot of uh, stimulus, which they're talking about doing? Germany and France just came out and said they're going to spend a bunch of money to get things going. Well, what do you think happened to our banks when we started spending a lot of money to get things going? Our banks went nuts on the upside. I'm anticipating that you're going to see European financials do very well. They've already done very well, but there's more to come. And these are a one-stop shop for the uh, financials in Europe. Okay. And uh, the next one uh, is just a general Europe fund ETF that gets you a one-stop shop into all the different European stocks that have pretty darn good uh, valuations. And uh, they probably have a, a very good future ahead of them if they come out and they do a lot of stimulus, which it seems like they're going to do. So also when you're thinking international, let's use our common sense. We have a trade deficit that could choke a racehorse. Right now, if we have a trade deficit, then those people have a trade surplus. Right. And when we we buy stuff from Germany and Indonesia and Asia and all over the place, the money goes back to them. 
and they have money now. So those companies make more money. And that's why Korea and Samsung and Toyota and Honda and all the rest of them, you know, they can make a whole bunch of money, right? Now you can spend all night trying to pick winners one at a time, or you do a one-stop shop. And here with Europe, with uh, the Vanguard uh, uh, ETF, you got a one-stop shop on the European stocks. Put that in the, into the connection with the European financials, and you got reasonable exposure to it. And then in six months, if we do see a big robust thing going on in Europe and these things take off, you will have laid your foundation now. Uh, moving averages are where they are, so you know where your get-out points would be, right there. Okay, so that's Europe. What else do you have going on? Well, you've got China and you've got uh, Asia. And so I'll show you a couple of different ways where you can take advantage of emerging markets. And this one here is called um, uh, the emerging market from Vanguard. And as you can see, uh, it got hit in the first quarter, right? And now it's been going what? Turning up. So you know where your moving averages are, you know where the price is. And our belief is by the end of the year, this won't be here, it'll be up in the white zone, okay? And that's your one-stop shop to get emerging market exposure. Uh, another way to get emerging market exposure is, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, to get expo. well, uh, you can get uh, exposure in uh, Asia in this particular one. This has a lot of uh, J Japan and uh, Korea in it. Pacific, it's called. And uh, you can see this one also has been doing pretty good lately. And uh, it looks like it, if it can get above 84, you know, you should be off to the races pretty good here. It's kind of hanging in there. Now, Japan and, uh, and Korea already had bigger moves than some of the other ones, right? So that's why they're a little more advanced. So in this particular case, the averages are very close to where the price is. And even that low is pretty close to where the price is. But then again, if you can start taking out these highs, then you have a thing called momentum. And we all know momentum is your friend if you're on the right side of it. So keep an eye on this. This is more from your Pacific, which is your Australia and your uh, uh, Japan and Korea and stuff like that. Okay. And then you can try to get income on your money by buying international stocks that pay dividends. And this thing pays a darn good dividend. Go check out the, uh, the distribution. You'll find it's pretty darn impressive. And this gives you two things. It gives you international exposure, which obviously has been a good place to be here, going from 52 to 66. But it also gives you, um, it also gives you uh, cash flow, income, dividends, and that's why people get into it. So again, that's another way to do it with regards to uh, uh, international. So I gave you a little bit of Europe. I give you now you also got Latin America. Let's not forget those guys. And there you go with uh, either uh, Mexico, which uh, you'll see has been doing pretty darn good. Again, they've got a trade surplus with us too, right? And uh, you can see, you know, ever since it, it had a problem in the first quarter, then it comes starts coming back. So once it broke above this 42 level, you had your buy thing. Right now, you definitely want it staying above the 40 four and a half for a 45 area. So you're not that far away. And uh, over time, if these guys continue to do their thing, it's very possible you'd be able to see some appreciation here. And then uh, you look at, and then of course, you know, uh, if we do international, um, uh, shall we say uh, manufacturing, a lot of people are talking about putting it into Mexico so they could, uh, so they could, uh, you know, be closer connected to us, not everything, you know, 23 uh, hours away by flight, right? Uh, this is Brazil. Brazil's having a lot of trouble, but they're turning it around a little bit here. Uh, there you go. Got a buy signal right there at 33. Looks pretty good. Highs were 38. As long as we can stay above these moving averages, you got to think there could be some potential there. Uh, this is a very big company with natural, a country with natural resources. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they have some uh, issues, but uh, that's why it's emerging market. And that's why it's probably not going to occur until later in the year, right? Right. So that's why we say it's uh, July 4th for the US and then it's gonna be uh, Europe, uh, Labor Day, and then it's gonna be end of year for emerging market. That's our plan, that's our thought. We'll see how it works out. So far, it looks pretty good. All right, let's get to these commodities which are going absolutely nuts, particularly the agricultural ones. 
Uh, let me uh, give you a, a chart so you can get an idea. Um, what you've got going on in these grains, uh, let's go over to, well, look at, let's look at them all so you get an idea. Corn, give me a May contract. They got supply problems and there's possible weather problems. And China's buying up things uh, like uh, no tomorrow, up another 15 today. I mean, corn used to trade at three bucks. Look at it. I mean, if I go back 20 years, you want to see what corn normally trades at? It'll give you an idea of what's going on. See, that's corn all these years, right? Well, I'll give you an idea how many years. How about from 2014 till 2021, it trades between three and 350. Maybe it gets to four if you're lucky. Now it's up here at seven. So you get the idea what they're talking about, food inflation? There you go. All right, now let's give you the wheat. And of course, you know, we told the subscribers about this stuff uh, last year when it was way down. And again, we mentioned weather in it, and we also mentioned China. So this is no surprise, anybody who gets the newsletter. All right, there's your wheat. This is another one. I'm giving you a long-term chart so you get into perspective how this run is. You see, this thing trades four or four fifty. Now it's trading up at seven. And I'll give you the last grain up here, which is soybeans. Ah, hang on here. Soybeans. Soybeans. July. Again, we were telling people about this eight, nine, ten dollars a bushel. So you know, you see eight, nine. See where you get the buy signal here, nine. You know, that's where you want to get in, and here is where you want to uh, celebrate. Okay, so big, big runs. Uh, how do you play uh, grains? You can use an ETF called DBA, and DBA is an um, agricultural uh, ETF from Invesco. And as you can see, this is what we've been telling people about. And as you can see, it's been matriculating to the upside very nicely. And uh, if you want exposure to the agricultural sector, this is a way of doing that with an ETF. Okay, uh, let me show you a couple of other ones here. I already told you about the metals and we talked about oil. So let's talk about a couple of ones that you might not be familiar with. And this is why you get the newsletter to get familiar with things that you're not familiar with, right? Okay, so uh, this is coffee for March of, uh, well, this is a year out. Let's see if I can get something on a year out. Yeah, can you see this? This thing, we were telling people about this at 100 and 110. Okay, so once it broke above 100 and 110, there's your buy signal. And this thing's up here now. Now this thing is scary because they have a lot of problems with crops with this thing. And can you see that it has broken above all this resistance of 140? So Lord knows what this thing could do if it gets going. And if the coffee really does have a problem with the supply, this thing is, uh, is gonna possibly be a very big winner. Again, nothing for sure, but I wouldn't wanna be short it looking like that. So let's see what JO looks like because that's the way you can play it with an ETF. And as you can see, this thing's going pretty good. All your moving averages are at 35. So you definitely don't want it under 35. And now it's at 41 and a half. And look, it takes out 45 and it's going to be able to get going too. So this is pretty exciting uh, for your speculative capital uh, to keep an eye on that. And the last one I'm going to show you here is the sugar. And um, I'm going to show you the contract first. We'll look at the May contract because with this thing, we got bullish at 12, okay? And uh, in the newsletter, we did discuss how the moving averages were all crossing and why you'd want to get in at 12. You see 12? All the moving averages are crossing. Ah, get back down here, right? All the moving averages are crossing. And so there you get your signal and then it runs up here, pulls back to the moving averages, does not take them out. Now we're back up here. If we can take out this area here, which is... Uh, it looks like uh, 18 and change. I mean, you know, this is another one that can go wherever it wants to go. And the way you work with this one is you go to Cane, C-A-N-E. And that'll give you exposure to the sugar area on an ETF. 
and there you go. Looks like it's going someplace now, right? Just blew out all the highs, looking pretty good. Moving averages are all here. It would be nice if they all start crossing. So you could still get some back and forth action here, but this thing does look like it does have a nice trend going to the upside. But again, pullbacks can happen even in bull markets. Okay, we are coming to the top of the hour right now. And I would like to uh, get to the, uh, uh, shall we say the, uh, the pitch here. Uh, optionprofessor.com. We do have a uh, weekly uh, newsletter we hand out and we cover all the different areas that were talked about. Plus you can email a question to us by email if something's on your mind and if we can help you, obviously we will. Now, guys, we've been doing this for decades. We obviously have a significant amount of product knowledge. We're obviously not talking about telling people to take a grand and turn it into 50 grand on some stupid YouTube commercial, okay? And uh, we have experience um, instructing people for decades, thousands and thousands and thousands of people worldwide. So we have a pretty good idea on how to take complicated subject matters and try to simplify them so you understand the risk and the reward to each one of them. Now, what do we charge in this kind of a situation? We charge $49 a month, or for people who understand basic math, we charge 297 bucks for the year, which breaks down to $24.75 a month divided by four. What are you talking about? Six or seven bucks an issue? That's not very much. How much money do you have at risk in the market? Okay. Would it be nice to be able to shoot a question over to somebody who has no ax to grind, who has no side in the game to try to give you an independent opinion and observation so that you can put it into part of your research and see if it might be helpful? Very simple. So you go to optionprofessor.com slash subscribe and you sign up today. And then this Friday, we'll send you out or Saturday, we'll send you out this week's newsletter and you're on your way. And then every week you get it. And from time to time, as you can tell, things change. So we'll be talking about those changes. But again, now we're talking about Europe and emerging markets, not after they happen. We are talking about value in September, not when they're always at their all time high. We talked about the commodities when they were way down last year, not when they're on their all-time highs going nuts. So it's nice to get some information before things happen. And that's what we try to do. Because we have familiarity with options, we also talk about hedging, which means what? Your covered call writing, your collar strategies, your um, uh, married puts, your replacement strategies using calls and call spreads, and trimming. We also talk about how if you have the money in your account and you'd like to try to buy the stock at a discount and get paid a premium at the same time, we talk about fully paid put writing. We also know how spreads work. They have all these wonderful comments. It's an iron condor. It's a butterfly. It's an iron butterfly. Listen, we know what those mean and we know how to turn them into layman's language so you understand the use and the risk of the tactic. And if you have questions on adjusting your position, we obviously know something about that as well. So there's an awful lot we're bringing to the table. Uh, 49 bucks a month, if you just want to take a look at it for one month, is peanuts. And uh, the yearly rate of 24.75 per month is ridiculous as well. Because again, the amount of knowledge and experience that we put into the letter is, uh, is fantastic. So again, it's option, O-P-T-I-O-N, professor, P R O F E S S O R dot com slash subscribe. You put your information there, we'll have your email, and then you're up and running on Friday when we come out with the new letter. Okay. It's great to be with you. Uh, it's 202, well, wherever you are, it's two minutes after the hour. And uh, this is optionprofessor.com. And we're very happy that you showed up. We certainly gave a, a full effort today to go through the wide variety of the markets. And again, take advantage of the newsletter at these current rates because these rates are subject to change. And so locking them in while they're very low here is a pretty good idea. All right, David, I'm sending it back to you. And again, thanks everybody. We'll be talking to you soon sometime down the road. All right, tons of good info today. So just a quick reminder for everyone, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast network. You can also go to timingresearch.com 
to get access to uh, any of the past sh uh, shows or events, uh, as well as this one, as soon as I can get it posted. And I uh, just want to thank uh, guests again for today, the Option Professor of uh, optionprofessor.com. So be sure to uh, be sure to go to optionprofessor.com slash subscribe and, and check out his uh, weekly newsletter. Thanks, everyone.